Welcome to this week's edition of the Pioneer Coaches Show. With me, I have head track and field coach Dan Myers. Coach, thanks for being here today. Jagger, thanks for having me. Hello there. <laughs> coach, this past weekend, uh, you had three, well, actually four school records. Uh, Natalie Barr set two. Janae Scott set one in the shot put. Uh, Kim Halsey in the pole vault. Just talk a little bit about uh, these school records here. Yeah, um, you know, I know going into the weekend, there was a very good possibility of coming away with some school records, but... Coming away with four on the women's side was just a, a huge day for the program. Um, we got there and we faced a little adversity as when we first got off the bus, there was a weather delay. So yeah. we immediately had to seat cover um, and the meet, you know, didn't get started for another two hours. And I've never been more proud of a group for just really and, you know, uh, just not giving a crap. <laughs> that, that, that throws you off a little bit sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, we we already had a group that went down Thursday night, um, and those uh, young ladies were competing in the hammer, and they still had an attempt left and took a two-hour break in between Macy Hilvers did, and um, Janae Scott kind of got kind of got froze there too because she was in the um, second flight of hammer and, um, you know, it was her debut in the hammer for the Pioneers. And um, But, you know, the team just rebounded well as soon as the it was done. We put up the team tent and we went to work and, um, you know, they moved to a rolling schedule at that point, which is a completely different than a time schedule because mm -hmm. you're just kind of guessing when you're going to run. Um, and then it ended up being a beautiful evening, some of the most perfect weather I've ever had for mid-distance events, maybe in my entire coaching career. Then the next day was like 70, 75 and sunny and just an excellent day all around. And um, just going through the records, you know, Kim Halsey, um, first uh, female in school history um, to go over three meters in the pole vault. Um, outdoors and then um, you know moving down which is a huge jump for her and then she had some great attempts which would have actually been at converting to feet 10-4 which is a completely different element for her and she had some really good attempts at it um, and then going down to uh, Janae Scott and uh, you know she had a 13-2-8 um, just above our outdoor school record and just below her personal best that she set in indoor um, still an outdoor um, personal record for her um, and you know just the type of competitor she is she came over and we were like got the record and she's like ah eh. she's <laughs> like that's that's not what I, that's not what I came here to do <laughs> and you know the records are kind of meaningless to her in a good way um, just because she wants to keep pushing her to her best and you know uh, she's pro I have to go back and look at an all-time list but that probably was like the third or fourth best discus performance that we've ever had on the women's side so she's gonna she's gonna knock that one off mm -hmm. it just it's just time will tell uh, when when that is gonna happen and um, you know, she she had a pretty good meet overall, um, just in all the throws opening up and, and with a lot of room to grow. And then, of course, Natalie Barr, you know, um, you know, going from 503 was uh, Alyssa Woods had that record, who's a Nicholas County graduate and to go to another Nicholas County graduate. And I would say that uh, along the process here of Natalie's freshman year and I got to coach Alyssa kind of on her way out. And, uh, you know, she's she's one of Natalie's biggest fans and to get a text from her and um you know, kind of going through that was, was a pretty cool as a coach um, to kind of, you know, reminisce with, with a former athlete and just how excited she was for Natalie and, and to go 450 and, and kind of a, kind of a, a overwhelming field as a, for a freshman was huge. And we know there's a lot more in the tank there. Um, and then to come back the next day and, and to run 217 and, and she broke through some barriers and, um, you know, going back, you know, looking where the league is now in the women's distance events, you know, th those marks are super competitive, but it, it's still tough to, to be all conference in, in the eight and 15 on the women's side. But I remember, you know, I wasn't here yet, but I remember when uh, coach Edwards, coach Spino were coaching Alyssa and, and for her to run those times in 2019, and it was a uh, 223 and a 503. I remember thinking like, wow, those are great marks for mm -hmm. a Glenville distance girl. And for us to take the kind of that next step um, is just huge for the program. Um, you know, it might not look like it, it was a home run on paper, but Natalie, I mean, to be where she is at this point in the year is just incredible for a freshman. And you had some other people uh, play some PRs on the women's and the men's side. And we talked about it a little bit during the indoor season. I believe when it was at Marshall, when you have all this Division One competition, does this help these girls? Because, I mean, you look at Natalie, she finished ninth, but the eight runners in front of her were all Division One athletes. Does this help them in a sense? Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, not to call out some of the, some of the girls and guys on our team, but, uh, I think some of them are kind of clueless when it comes to it, which uh, until they, <laughs> it, which is kind of good until they see obviously like a Marshall because, you know, you know, Marshall race, their full, some of the, most of their full group there. Um, and then like a Clemson or a Wake Forest, I think outside of that, they kind of lose focus on it in a good way. Yeah. Um, but I do think that it provides 
everyone a fair chance to run a great time in every single heat, no matter where you're at, um, the, how they set up these meets. So I think that's big. And then along with just seeing a lot of great athletes compete, I think that it helps them understand the level that they're at and the level they can be at. Um, so I think it definitely helps from a confidence perspective and, um, you know, it allows us to, to, to bring out our best. And then uh, coming into this week, you go to West Virginia, another place where it's simply just track and field complex. What are your expectations there? I mean, you're coming off a big week at, uh, at Charlotte. Well, I'm excited to kind of get some people back into the fold that we didn't take to Charlotte. Um, Friday will just be hammer. Um, so it'll be just a hammer day only. And then and Saturday, we'll take our full group up on the bus to, to W and um, you know, there's some key races there um, that I think that could be huge, especially if W kind of puts in some of their um, some. Of the, it's it's pretty early for for uh, Division One distance runners to be running, yeah. um, just because of kind of where their season is. But I think they'll have some girls in there trying to shake off the rust coming off of indoor. Um, you know, particularly selfishly, I'm hoping they put a, you know some of their girls run the eight and fifteen. Oh, um, yeah. You know, kind of push <laughs> Natalie, um, and, and then even in the throws uh, to push like a Janae and stuff like that. And we'll see some conference schools, and I think that's big. We saw all um mainly just concord down at, at uh charlotte so for us i think we'll see west liberty and and a wesleyan and, and and some schools like that so i think that'll be huge um and uh you know we're looking for for some big marks coming this weekend uh men's 400 hurdles we're hoping to take some time off um some of our men's throwers we're hoping to get over that 40 meter mark and discus to kind of move us up on the leaderboard some big uh, marks on men's shot so we have some big goals for this weekend well, Coach, uh, we appreciate you coming on today, and uh, good luck this weekend. Yep, thanks for having me. Welcome back to this week's edition of the Pioneer Coaches Show. With me now, head women's basketball coach, Emily Stoller. Coach, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me on. So, Coach, you finished the um, th this past season in the MEC tournament, lost in the first round to Notre Dame. Uh, just quickly, your thoughts on that. It was just a tough game. Like you you mentioned your post-game presser, just got out-rebounded. Just your thoughts on that, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, with the, the announcement of Notre Dame uh, – College closing there it was definitely we knew it was going to be a very hard game. Uh, th those girls were playing every game like it was their last, and uh, it meant a little bit different to them down at the tournament this year than a lot of the other teams. And uh, for that, um, you know, they they gave us their their best game. I mean, percentage wise, mm -hmm. we look across the chart. Um, they shot the ball extremely well. They were really efficient from the floor. Um, you know, I think we you know we did. We did. We we worked hard. We did a lot, a lot of a good things, but we also had uh, you know a lot of mistakes that really cost us. We got out rebounded by 13. We knew going down to the tournament we had to rebound the basketball, and that was one of our strong points that we were focusing on there in the week prior. Um, and you know the reality is we didn't. Mm -hmm. You talked about it a little bit in your post game presser um, about this season. A lot of adversity and just a lot in in general. Just what has this first season taught you? Um, I, you know, it, it taught me uh, that, you know, to work through adversity, um, you know, and rely on my coaching staff throughout. Um, and we encountered a lot of different issues throughout the entire year that, um, you know, it was our first time handling it, my, my first time handling it alone and my first time handling it, uh, you know, leaning on my coaching staff throughout, um, you know, really props to the, the group of girls that we had this year. Um, you know, we, we had a lot of uh, injuries and they came sporadically throughout the season and, mm -hmm. You know, at different times we were trying to piece, um, you know, different things that we hadn't really worked with um, throughout the year. Um, and, and we had to adjust our, our game plan in a lot of different games down the stretch. And, you know, our, our, I think our record really, really shows that uh, to where we were trying to work through those uh, those bumps. But, you know, this group of girls really uh, worked hard to get through that. And, you know, I know it was tough for me as a coach, so I can only imagine how tough it was for them as a player. Um, yeah. And then uh, now – you're into the off season. You have an earlier jump than you did last year. Uh, you got the job in what uh, May, June last year. Now you're able to. I mean, the portal opened today as we're recording this, so you're able to get an earlier jump. When you look at um, who you want to get for next year, because like we talked about before the show, you run the Global State style, but you want people to fit your style. So when you're looking at people to bring in for next year, what do you look at? Uh, is it you know shooting, defense? Well, just what do you look at? Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, where we're headed towards, you know, in our recruiting path here, and it's real early uh, and, and, you know, very blessed for that uh, to be able to get like a jump start on, mm -hmm. on everything. Um, but we're really looking to build the culture up uh, to where, you know, it, it once was when, when uh, you look back and you, you see all those championships. And um, it, it takes a lot more than just talent to win those championships. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, we're definitely looking to, to start with building the culture. And we're, we're, we're really uh, sought out to recruit 
culture driven kids. And, um, you know, we're really excited about that. So the recruitment period will be based around uh, culture-driven kids. And, and when you look at who you want, is it a mix of high school transfers or just transfers, just high school? What do you look at when you do that? Yeah, so I, th- I think, uh, you know, where we've always been at is uh, we're looking at transfers, and we, we always recruit a lot of JUCO kids. Um, you know, we, we really have stayed away from uh, recruiting high school kids, but I think I already have three or four committed <laughs> Uh, from the high school level, uh, which are all really good ball players, and I'm excited about that. Uh, so it'll be a, a, a mix of, of you know young young kids, and then a couple old heads here and there. <laughs> <laughs> well, coach, um, you know it was it was fun to watch. You know the season. I think there's a lot of adversity, a lot of people didn't see, but it was it was a joy to cover you guys, and uh, we appreciate you coming on today. Appreciate you for having me. Welcome back to this week's edition of the Pioneer Coaches Show. With me now, I've head acrobatics and tumbling coach Taylor Broadwater. Coach, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. This past weekend, Coach, uh, this past week, actually, uh, you had cuts down. Bluefield State dropped out. You fell 256.830, uh, 256.060. It was a tough loss there. But I want to hit on um, Peyton Siminski and Savannah Duckworth. We didn't get to talk about it last week. Uh, Siminski was specialist of the week. Savannah Duckworth, uh, honorable mention. I know during the year, you're, you've been really high on uh, Savannah Duckworth getting uh, some accolades, and she finally got it. Just, you know, your thoughts on, on those for those two girls. Uh, that was obviously a good time. Um Definitely two athletes that are very deserving of those awards and something that, yes, like we talked about, um, Savannah deserved a lot of accolades. I felt like last year that she didn't necessarily Mm -hmm. get um, as a freshman, like she was a standout freshman um, in basically as many events as she possibly could be. So that's hard to do coming in as a freshman Um, this year. She has kept that going. Um, Definitely a great athlete for us and someone who deserved that recognition. She works extremely hard. Um, obviously I, I told the team too, like those two would not have gotten those accolades without the entire team. They're not out there on the floor by themselves doing all those events. Um, so it took the whole team and I think that that was well-deserved and I'm glad that some of their talent finally showed and the NCATA recognized, uh, them for their efforts and everything that they've been doing for this team. But Peyton, obviously, like we talked about before her, um, performance at our try and meet, like that was close to perfect. A couple Um, of 995s. Yeah. Two 995s and a 9.8. It doesn't get much better than that. Mm -hmm. Um, She's a solid mid for us. She works hard. She's always willing to take corrections, very coachable. Um, so just something that we've talked about a lot is just continuing to understand that it takes the whole team. It's mm-hmm. not just one athlete, and I stress that to them. Uh, those two obviously were the ones that got the award, but it really does take the whole team. And then uh, this coming week, um, you will go to Notre Dame, a team who has improved. If you go back and look at their old scores, they were in the 230s. Now they, uh, this past weekend at Trine, they, they almost reached 250. Just your thoughts on that match up there. Uh, I'm excited to go there uh, against Notre Dame. They are a good team, and they're continuing to get better. Um, they're putting up harder skills each meet. They're improving in every aspect, I feel like. They're a great team, and I think they have a lot to show now this season. So I'm very excited to take the girls and see what we do. I'm hoping that we can just relax and do what we know how to do. We've stressed that again this week. Um, I still think that we're lacking that relaxation when we're out on the mat they get all jittery especially with our first event compulsory acro um that showed at the last meet it's an event that we can do in practice very well but then they go to the meet and they get in their head a little bit about it um so just trying to relax and do what we know how to do and hopefully this week that will pay off for us and how do you think you can get them to relax because it's very easy in practice you're not competing in front of anybody right then you get into a meet i mean cuts down traveled well this past weekend you always have a good crowd how can you kind of get them to that relaxing state uh the biggest thing this week that we talked about is why are we changing stuff when we go out on the mat if we're changing things and obviously that throws off your top or that can throw off your base um so the biggest thing is just you have to execute and do what you know how to do it does not matter that it's the first event it doesn't matter that we're now um in the middle of the mat instead of on the side of the mat because they warm up well at meets Um, I said, basically what I need you guys to do is go out there and pretend that there's no one on either side of the mat and it's you and I in there. So I'm hoping that this week they can kind of block that out and get a good start. Um, we obviously have a better meet when we start out the first event. Well, so hopefully that will show this week, but we'll see, we'll see (laughs) if they can do it. And then, uh, you just recently added Western New state to the schedule. Uh, once again, you'll, you'll go there on March 27th for a uh, weekday meet, but, uh, coach, we appreciate you coming on today and a good luck this week. Thank you so much. Welcome back to this week's edition of the Pioneer Coaches Show. With me now, head men's basketball coach Bob Bolin. Coach, thanks for being here today. Jagger, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. <laughs> so uh, we didn't get to talk to you last week to uh, speak on the MC tournament. Uh, you started out against Frostburg, uh, the 10 seed, in the, in the 7-10 game. Blew them out, 95-59. Your thoughts on that game first? Well, I thought we really came out with a lot of energy. You know, the three was going down for us. We shot the ball real well. Uh 
you know, it's kind of a blur being being a few days ago, <laughs> but uh, you know, just was real happy with how we played. A uh, couple seniors that stood out. I uh, thought Turbo really played well. James Franklin made some shots. Uh, you know, just to mention those guys and. And, you know, we were just really clicking on all cylinders, and it was a great win. You turned around um, on that Friday, played the second seed West Liberty. They controlled most of the first half. You made a run there late, cut it to seven. They pulled away. They hit 18 threes in that game. It just – you kind of felt it early in the game. I think they were five or six start out. It was just going to be one of those days for them from three. Just your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, we were having trouble staying in front of the ball. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're having trouble staying in front of the ball, you have to help. And that was opening up those threes for them. And, uh, you know, I mean, they were knocking them down. And if you look at it, they hit 12 the first half and a couple to start the second half. They only hit six in the second half, so they yeah. cut in half. Yeah, but you look up there, and we were still only down 72 to 65. Mm -hmm. And we were right and had the ball. Mm -hmm. And so our, our guys fought hard. Uh, and I just thought when we played them here, we stayed in front of the ball better. And, and everybody says, oh, run them off the three, do this. You can't run people off the three if you're having trouble staying in front of the ball. <laughs> you know, I was sit there and debate. I said, well, if if we would have just not helped at all, that could have knocked those 18 threes down. But instead of having all those twos, how many more twos would they have had if yeah. we wouldn't have been helping against the layups? Exactly. So, and I thought they do a great job of dribble penetration. And uh, you know, when Charleston played them, they stayed in front of the ball. So they didn't have to help, and they really limited those threes. But I was proud of the effort of our guys. Uh, thought Trevor had a big game. Uh, you know, yeah. he's done great things. And Rye Gad really stepped up, went six for six, and made made some big shots during our run the second. Yeah, half. he was so, crucial in that run. I think he had uh, eight or ten straight points during that yeah. run. Yeah. Then I thought we missed him once. I think it might have, may have been seventy two sixty five. I thought we had him again. But um, I thought our guys competed, played hard, uh, represented the university well. So I, I was very pleased with them. And, and that ended the season. I just wanted to ask you, because you talked about it a little bit in your post-game presser, just your thoughts on your first season back. I mean, it had been a minute since you've been a head coach, but and it's your first year in the NBC. Just how that went for you? Oh, I mean, I enjoyed a lot of things about it. It was a little bit more difficult than I suspected trying to – blend guys that you didn't recruit in with guys you you did recruit. I, I thought that was a little bit more difficult than I expected. But uh, all in all, I, I thought our guys had great attitudes. They worked hard, and, and we kept getting better. And if you look at that first week of the season, how bad badly that started. But then you look, Gannon. And number one, number yeah. one team in the region. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, they, they ended up having a pretty good year. Yeah, but, pretty uh, good. <laughs> yeah, but – uh, somebody said it was the second most wins Glenville's had in the last nine years. Yeah, I remember wow. talking about that. Yeah, so that's you know we won one fourteen, and I, I'm sure that's disappointing to our players because I think that we thought we would have a better year, but a lot of positives happened from that first year, and it's something we can build on. And uh, I'm looking forward to the future. Yeah, because you spoke in your first game presser too about. You know, you had Rye and Trevor up there and talk about this is what college basketball is about. Guys like oh. Trevor, guys like Gus, Tur uh, Turbo, seniors, just a little bit on those guys. Oh, I'll tell you, you know, Turbo had a terrific year, second team all conference. Gus really played well late in the year uh, when his minutes went up, and I thought he did a great job for us. Uh, Trevor was solid. You know, early in the year, he wasn't playing much, and he was always the same guy, the same team guy. Uh, James Franklin had some big games here and there. So th those seniors, I thought, did a good job. And then, you know, when you talk about our returners, uh, Dom Penn, you know, had played big-time Division ones, but he didn't get huge minutes. Mm -hmm. And this was kind of his first year of actually being a big part of a team in college. I thought he had a great year. Devin Collins, uh, all-conference honorable mention, uh, was real pleased with the year he had. Rygad. Really you know, came on late in the year. Oh, yeah. Uh, just uh, his toughness and and those kind of things really helped us. Prince coming in, coming in here, <clears throat> excuse me, second semester uh, was a big help. And I think I'm leaving one out of our returner. So Corey Bolden, redshirted, yeah, he can red really shirt. shoot the ball. Uh, he'll be back next year. So, uh, you know, looking forward, looking forward to having those back. And Jordan Holmes got better. You know, every day in practice. And he's been in the gym a lot, too. I see yeah. him out here all the time. Oh, now. yeah. He's a hard worker. And, 
you know, we'll have seven or eight coming back from last year, and we'll go out and recruit and, uh, you know, look to be a force next year in this conference. Yeah, because I wanted to ask you about, you know, it's changed a lot since you you were last the head coach with the transfer portal um, and all that. Just how was when – you, when you look into recruiting, how does that philosophy work out for you when it comes to – recruiting now with high school kids and the transfer portal because portal gets you quick fixes high school guys are more of you know developmental guys just how's that work for you yeah are they I mean when you think about it, really uh, I was talking to one of my coaching friends who recruited some really good high school players and now two years later they have five division one offers I mean so it's different it's it's kind of a year-to-year thing now mm-hmm. and uh you know, I think a lot of the older coaches I mean Look at Nick Saban. He said, hey, forget this, the NIL. He said, I don't want to. And a lot of them just say, hey, I don't want to deal with this. Uh, you know, at this level, you're not dealing with the NIL so much. But uh, it's different. And, you know, kids, kids can leave. And, you know, most of the time it's mutual. Mm-hmm. When a kid comes and wants to leave, you're probably thinking it's probably better for him. And most of the time it's mutual. But you will have those, those other times. And I think that's more when you get a really good freshman because I think now you can get better freshmen because the Division ones are waiting on the portal and see yeah. who lands where. But I think we have to have a mixture of high school, junior college, and the portal. Mm-hmm. And we are aggressively working all three of those right now, and uh, we're, we're going to put a great team together next year. There's not a doubt in my mind. Well, Coach, uh, it was a pleasure covering you guys all year. I, I enjoyed every second of it, but uh, we appreciate you coming on today. Oh, I'm glad to be here and go Pioneers. <laughs> Welcome back to this week's edition of the Pioneer Coaches Show. With me now, I have head baseball coach Jimmy Mullins. Coach, thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me. Coach, this past weekend won three out of four against uh, Northern Division, uh, Fairmont State and Frostburg State. Started out with Fairmont on Saturday. Uh, swept them in the doubleheader, 8-3 to three in the first one, 6-3 to three in the second. Just your thoughts on those two wins. Yeah, it was definitely uh, great to get out to a good start to conference play. Every game is a playoff game from here on out for us. But uh, Julian Manaya gave us another great start there on game one. And uh, Diego Tamariz gave us a good start on game two. And he was able to locate his fastball. He's been working really, really hard on his command. He knows how important it is to to be able to locate his fastball and and command the strike zone. And uh, they both look great and and gave us good starts. Offensively, uh, our approach has been improving and improving and improving Mm -hmm. and able to do some little things and, swinging at the right pitches and the right situations, and we were able to really do some things uh, on the bases, too. We, You know, there was a pop-up to the shortstop that we tagged up on from third and scored and just little tiny things that really got the momentum on our side and, and uh, seems like we kept it for most of that day Saturday. And then you turned around on Sunday, um, got one against Frostburg, the, uh, the, the Northern Division favorite to start out the year. Uh, you started out – with a five to two victory in the first game, fell in the second one nine to four. But first in that uh, that opening victory, Austin Corn went six innings, gave you really good six innings. I, I think that something that he really needed as a, as a player with his, you know the injury battle he's had and not being able to pitch a lot of innings. Just your thoughts on that on that victory? Yeah, it was definitely awesome to get him back and get a good quality start. Uh, his command wasn't all there early in the counts. He he fell behind quite a few batters two and zero, oh, two and one, three and zero, oh. um, but he was able to get them to swing at pitches that they normally wouldn't swing at because, you know, his stuff is good. And he was able to get up there around 80-something pitches, which is great. He was still feeling good, which is a good sign. Uh, just being able to have him back really helps us. Uh, as we know, we were short a little bit for a few weeks. But he uh, having a good quality start is good for his his mentals. And, and it's also good for the team because we know that, uh, you know, we got our guys back and we're able to battle. And being able to go on the road and – and beat uh, the Northern Division favorite at their place uh, when the conditions aren't, you know, that great is, is really good for us. And then uh, Fabian Escalante was 8-16 of this weekend, batted 500 with six RBIs, three doubles, I believe. Just speak on his performance, just how good he's been so far. Yeah, you know, he's he's been starting the year really, really good and really hot, but he's very consistent in his preparation. Uh, he doesn't get outside too much and experiment with things that, that he's not real comfortable with, which isn't a bad thing for mm-hmm. a guy like him because he understands his swing. He understands what he needs to do. He understands how the other team is going to pitch him. And, um, you know, he trains and prepares for that. And I also got to give him credit. I mean, he's a, he's a really good hitting coach for us. I mean, he really helps connect with the rest of our hitters. 
um, you know, after the trip down south, he, he, he ran his own hitters meeting with the guys and just talked about some of the approaches that need to change. And it's so important, at least in the game of baseball, to have guys on the field who are players who are like an extension of the head coach and the coaching staff mm -hmm. to give the same message, be on the same page, and demand things from the ground level from players. And him being able to do that, uh, you know, he did the same thing last year too, but it's just a little bigger capacity here. But him being able to do that uh, immediately impacted us, and, and I'm, I'm grateful for him. He's a great leader. If he wants to coach baseball, he'd be a great baseball coach. But right now we just want him to keep catching barrels and driving in runs and doing things for us. And that, that's obviously helped because, like you mentioned, uh, the past couple of weeks, Mason Lohr, his average has jumped in the 300s. Uh, Zach Morris has improved. It's really It helps him as well, too, because it gives him guys around him that can uh, – Swing the bat as well, but looking towards this weekend, you host Salem and Notre Dame. Salem won't <laughs> count for a Mountain East win or Mountain East uh, game. Notre Dame will. How does the uh, these opening weekend wins, you know, help carry the momentum over to this coming weekend? Because, like you said, every game's a playoff game. It's just so important. Yeah, for sure. And just going back to what you said about Mason and and Zach Mars, things like that. So, seven inning baseball games are are much different than nine inning games. Mm -hmm. uh, it gets late early, they say, in the seven inning game. So. When we're in the third inning, it's almost like being in the you know fifth, sixth inning of a nine-inning game. And for that reason, uh, we bat Fabian oftentimes in the three-hole as opposed to the four-hole where he may more traditionally play in a nine-inning game. That allows him to get an extra at-bat uh, throughout the game. Statistically, they get 1.3 more at-bats a game in the three-hole than the four-hole. Also, it ensures he's going to hit in the first inning. And once we moved him to the three-hole, and Lore being productive in the leadoff spot, very often in the first inning we've been able to hit with a runner in scoring position and have Fabian and Zach Morris both up, at least with a chance we get one hit to score a run there. Get early. the two of them yep. early. Mm -hmm. And Adam Bright, as a freshman, moving into the two-hole there um, really, really helps us. He's, he's even-keeled, he's got great baseball IQ, and he's tough. Having Mason Lore, we, we know how tough he is, and then a tough Adam Bright right behind him, and Adam's able to bunt the ball around. Uh, he's able to hit and run, and he's able to swing at the pitches he should swing at. And when Mason gets on base, we're almost automatic getting him the second or third, either with a bunt or, or with a productive at bat. And again, then Fabian and Zach Morris get the hit. Uh, but having those guys be productive around them definitely helps. And we got to get it going a little bit at the bottom of our lineup. But what we've done well there is – uh, being able to use the bunt game. We ran a squeeze here uh, against Frostburg. We ran a squeeze with Zach Morris, but uh, he's our best bunter. He, he takes it serious during practice, and everything matters. But the bottom of our order, we've been hitting and running more, bunting the ball around and moving runners, and all that stuff helps because it's not as much pressure on Fabian and Zach Morris mm -hmm. to have to score a run with one swing, and that helps us. And hopefully uh, you know, we can carry that on to the next weekend as well. Like you said, we play Salem. Uh, on Saturday, doubleheader, and then, again, conference games on Sunday versus Notre Dame. And hopefully we can uh, have a good weekend there and continue continue towards trying to get into the tournament. Well, Coach, uh, we appreciate you coming on today, and uh, good luck this weekend. Yeah, thank you all. Welcome back to this week's edition of the Pioneer Coaches Show. With me, I have head wrestling coach Dylan Cottrell. Coach, thanks for being here today. Yeah, excited to be back after this weekend. It was, uh, it was a good time. Yeah, this past weekend you're at the NCAA National Championships in Wichita, Kansas. Had five guys um, wrestle there. Three were knocked out in the first day, and then you had obviously uh, Guy and Gavin take All-American the second day. First, I want to start with uh, the three guys who got knocked out on Friday, uh, Brady Ross, Nick Johnson, and Gavin Chandler. Just your, your thoughts on them, and just so you can speak on how they wrestled this weekend. Yeah, I thought all three wrestled tough. Um, you know, Brady had a prelim that we talked about last week mm -hmm. that he needed to win. He did his job there. Um, got the win. Um, dropped down, had a, a kid who went on to be an All-American. Um, I think the kid got seventh. Um, you know, Brady actually wrestled him really tough. Got in a scramble in the first that he lost um, that I think could have changed the match a whole lot. Um, you know, but it's it, it's okay. It happens, right? And then um, coming up on the backside, right, got into a, a match that went into sudden victory over time. Um, you know, came out on the wrong end of it. I, I thought he wrestled well. Um you know, we've, we've talked with Brady and, and you're in the middle of it. You can't change much, you know, right after, you know, we're, we're telling him, Hey, you know, great season. We're proud of you. Right. Do you want to get better? Right. And here's X, Y, and Z that you have to do over summer, right. To, to get better. And, uh, 
know, Brady has a lot of talent in, in, in places that other people don't. And he's a style matchup, a bad style matchup for a lot of people because of that. Mm -hmm. Um, but on the other end of it, he has certain things that he knows he has to get better at. Right. And, um, you know, it's not always fun to do the things that you're not very good at. And, uh, you know, he knows that and, and he'll work on it. And, um, you know, the, the position of, of getting to the legs consistently for him, right, is a, is a big problem. And if he fixes that, right, it, it's sky's the limit. Um, you know, he's he almost beats an All-American uh, wrestling, at, you know, a, where pretty much we're, you know, a one-trick pony on our feet, right? Um, and it's a really good trick. You know, he's really good at scrambling and, and making guys work, right? But we have to be able to get to the legs. And, uh, you know, I, we're going to work on that with him, right? When he's back in, in, in the summer and, and everything like that, and he's going to get a lot better. But, um, you know, I was proud of him. He started at 84 on the year, went down to 74, right? And then we had some stuff with the team, and then he goes all the way down to 65. So a kid who, you know, uh, you ask a lot out of him and he, he says yes and goes and gets it done. And I thought he did a really good job with controlling his weight and, and getting used to that weight class at the end of the year. So I was really proud of him, you know, and then uh, Gavin Shamlin, we talked about it and how awesome it was. He's been with me since we started the program. Right. And, and uh, you know, he's been a huge part of the program, an amazing kid comes from an amazing family. Um, and he wrestled really hard, right. He was right there with the kid who got fifth in the first round and uh, you know, we pushing him. And, uh, you know, you get to the second round, you know, the, the score is a little lopsided compared to how close the match was, right? We had to go and try stuff at the end. Um, and, you know, I, I can't say enough about, you know, how tough Gavin is and how much better he's got here. Um, he's going to do some great things in his life. Doesn't really matter what it is. Um, and, and, yeah, his story is awesome to just uh, kind of see where he came from when he came in to all the way now making it as a national qualifier. I know that these guys wanted to all American, right? They wanted to go out and, and that's fine. Right. Like that, that is a great thing. And I'm glad they're disappointed because that means that they, they gave a crap. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, at the end of the day, it's a wrestling match, right? These kids are going to go and, and, you know, when they leave us, they're going to do great things because they're great people. Um, and, uh, yeah, I know. Awesome for him. Awesome. He got to experience it. I, I know it's not what he wanted. Right. And it's not what we wanted, but it's okay. Right. We'll, we'll move forward. And, and, it's not going to change who Gavin is, um, you know, and then we talked a little bit about Nick Johnson before this, um, you know, in all honesty, I'm not giving excuses. He had a, he had a pretty tough, he had a pretty tough draw and it happens sometimes, right? There's everybody. Yeah, number one there's, wrestler in the country. There's right? always someone that gets the crappy draw, yeah, right? And, and so, be him this time. yeah. And, uh, you know, he's, uh, there's eight guys that are seated, right? And then they seed nine, 10 as replacements. If one of the eight go out. Nick was the nine, right? And so instead of being seated and putting in an advantageous position, the other 10 guys in the bracket, they're just filled in, right? Well, he's the next highest guy, and he gets put with the one seed, who's a two-time returning national champ. That's literally as bad as the blind draw can get. <laughs> Again. Um, so he wrestled him tough, you know, um, and ended up losing that match, came back, wrestled a kid from Kutztown we hadn't seen, and really – really demolished him, looked really good, um, topped, looked good. Um, and then, you know, he gets against a, a guy, another guy who All-Americans, so both guys that he lost to were All-Americans. Um, you know, I think this kid got fifth. And uh, he wrestled him tough. You know, we talked a little bit. He's only been here for two months, right? The It's hard to be in amazing, amazing shape in two months. And I think, I think that one um, was a position where you ran into a guy who was in really, really good shape and uh, – kind of wore on us a little bit late in the match. Uh, but, no, you know, Nick had a really good shot early. They got in a scramble, and uh, kid locked up a cradle on a go-behind, and Nick kind of scrambled through it, took him to his back. You know, and I, I don't know if he was just surprised to be in the position or, um, you know, if the kid was just that strong that he kind of powered out of it. But, you know, I honestly thought that we might get a pin there. Um, you know, we go up early. And, the, the you know, it plays out through the match. We end up losing it. But for, for what he did to – to come in here, hadn't wrestled in seven, six, seven years, right? Hasn't been on a, on a wrestling mat and at a competitive level in six or seven years. Comes in, practices for two months, makes the NCAA tournament, right? And is seconds, right? You get the pin. It's sec he's seconds away from being an All-American, right? He beat in the second semester the guy who got eighth and the guy who got third, right? So, you know, he's right there, um, you know, and that's, that's with not having – 
any time at all, right? You know, he loses to the number one guy in the country. He loses to the number five guy. He's beat this year, the number three and the number eight, right? He's in the mix. Um, so really excited for him next year. Um, yeah, and uh, how he's going to do moving forward. I know it's going to be motivation for him and Brady coming back for next year. And then moving forward, uh, Gavin Kiocho became the first pioneer in program history to be a two-time All-American uh, guy, became the third overall All-American in program history. They both made it to the second day. Uh, guy wrestled to a third-place finish. Uh, Gavin got second. I know it's not what he won, defending national champion. Still, though, a great season for those guys. Just to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, awesome. What a what a day for those guys. <laughs> you know, obviously, I think uh, – I think the only reason why we're talking about this at all is just because it's the simple fact that Gavin won it last year. And then you, your expectation is he wins all the time. Mm-hmm. He wins all the time, wins all the time. Second is still phenomenal. Right. National I mean, runner up. you know, if, if last year didn't happen and we're sitting here right now and we're back and we're saying Gavin Kiosha got second and Guy Dale Leonardo's got third, we're raising the roof. Yeah, we're so yeah. excited. Oh, my mm-hmm. God. Like, where's this program going? Like, and uh, we're still like that. Don't get me wrong. In a lot of spheres, I think it's just a, a little bit of a bigger blow because – just of what happened last year. And, you know, that's not fair because what an amazing season, mm-hmm. right, for both of them. I agree. And I an agree. amazing tournament. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, guys comes, guy comes in, he's seated fifth, right? He takes third, out wrestles his seed, beats three guys in the tournament that he'd lost to this year, right? He, in the, in the quarters, um, he wrestles Devin Bear. We lost to him eight to six at Midwest. We beat him eight to six to be an All-American. Right. We lose to the number one seed, returning undefeated national champ, um, drop down. We drop down to a guy that we've lost to twice. Right. Got pinned by him at Midwest in a scramble. Um, Goes out, beats him five to one. Pretty convincing. Looks great. Okay, now you're wrestling for third and fourth. All right. Who do you got? The kid who you lost to seven to one last weekend in the regional finals. What does he do? Beats him eight to one. Right, completely switches the score, almost majors him. Um, guy did such a good job on getting to shots, getting to some different shots that he hasn't got to all year. And then the main thing was, and it's not that he's a bad finisher, right? But he's been in some situations where he's lost matches, right? Because the one time he got to a leg, he didn't finish. All three of those matches, right? The same single leg that we'd have been having trouble with finishing, he finishes it. And it's something that we've continued to go over in the practice room, which is awesome. That means that he's taken, you know, what we're teaching him and being able to apply it. Um, you know, both of those dudes are such good dudes, and it's awesome. It's awesome to see it happen for him and then put it together. Um, you know, and then you look at Gavin's. He was the three seed. He over-wrestled his seed too, right? You know, yes, we wanted a national title. And, you know, it, little things here and there in the bracket, and I'm not going to get into them, could have changed things, but Gavin Gavin wrestled his butt off. He looked good. He actually tweaked his knee up pretty good in his quarterfinals match, right? Uh, some M- MCL issues um, that, you know, me as a coach internally, I was kind of worried about, right? Um, Gavin's never hurt, right? He, he, I don't think he's been hurt the three years he's been here at all. Um, so I'm, how is he going to respond? Right. He's got to wrestle in the national semis tomorrow after he tweaks this. How's he going to be? How tight's it going to get overnight? Um, didn't say a word. Didn't say a word. <laughs> Just how he is. Taped it up, went out there, you know, beat beat the dude, you know, majored the dude nine to one in the semis, uh, looked looked golden, wrestled well in the finals, right? The guy is really, really good. And he's a stylist, he's a stylistic matchup, a bad matchup for Gavin, right? But you know, I was talking with Coach Skiles actually on the way in, and he was like, you know, it's crazy that that kid was undefeated and he'd never made the national tournament before. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That kid didn't make the national tournament before because he's been wrestling Division One for the last three years. He was ranked 17th in the whole country, Division One last year, and was 18-1 and one in Division One when he decided, well, when he lost his wrestle-off in his starting position, right? So – that like shows you how good he was and how good of a team he was on before. He was 18 and one and 17th in the country. Division, division one. Division one last year. He would have made the NCAA tournament at division one, right? He loses his spot, right? And he's, he decides to go wrestle, right? And so, you know, I, I don't think a lot of people know how good that kid is. He might be the best, the one of the best or most talented kid in all of division two, right? Not just in Gavin's weight class. Gavin's weight class was tough. 
right? 133 was a ringer from one through eight. I mean, the returning, <laughs> the returning national runner up who Gavin beat last year, guess what happened to him? He went 0 and 2. That tells you right there in how this bracket. Tough it was. 0 and 2 in the bracket, right? Returning national finals, number two seed, right? 0 and 2. It was tough, right? And Gavin, Gavin wrestled really well through it, got back again. I mean, here's the thing, right? You're looking up on the board. It's showing the this year's Division II a Hall of people going in the Hall of Fame, right? If Gavin has another year remotely close to what he did this year, he's going to be in the NCAA Hall of Fame, Division II, right? Hundred percent. Like a Hall, you know, a Hall of Fame athlete. He's going to be in it, the NCAA Division II Wrestling Hall of Fame, if he continues to do what he did. He's an amazing kid. You know, he does everything right. He he works his butt off, um, and he's super super talented. Right. And, and we're excited to have him, you know, him and Guy back for another year. You know, I just did the calculations on everybody and what they return. And that's not counting, you know, the recruits you're bringing in, all that. It's just who's returning, what, and how many points. And we're sitting at eighth, right, for next year on returning points. Um, so you're coming back, looking at a top 10. And that's not counting, you know, some of the guys we've talked about before, mm-hmm. kind of off here and how excited we are for them. So we are, uh, we are going to be really, really good next year, and I'm excited for it. Um, I got a, like I said, I got a job to do over the next two months in recruiting. Um, but if I can get it done, which you know I got to, these guys get it done. You know I got, I can't, I can't drop the ball, mm-hmm. right? So I got to get it done, and I got to put really good talent around them and, and help them not only to just be able to be able to go there and say, all right, well, I'm going to win an individual national title, but hey, we're we're going to win it as a team, mm-hmm. yeah. Because I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask you about that. You bring four of your five guys that uh, qualified for the national championships return. You talked about um, transfers, recruits, and all that. I just wanted to pick your brain about your philosophy for this summer bringing – because you said it's a very busy two months for you coming in. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm glad you brought up the team national title because you won a conference championship. I know you always talk about individual championships. But, I mean, you're on the cusp of – you bring in more guys, I mean, you have a chance at winning a national title as a team. Just, you know, your your philosophy, I guess, for this this coming up uh, off season for recruiting. You know, here in two months, I can I can probably tell you, right, really where I think we're at. Um, if we get some of the guys that are coming in, right, for visits and for our other stuff, and you know, even if we don't, we still have so much talent. Mm-hmm. Um, I I believe 100 percent we can be here three six you know three sixty five from now talking about winning a national championship. Um, I, I think we have that much talent, right? And uh, if I know anything from this year is that our team's going to work for it, right? Um, this this has been the hardest working team I've had in the four years I've been here. And, uh, you know, again, we've said it multiple times, maybe not the most talented team I've had in the four years I was here, but it, it, doesn't, it didn't really matter, right? Because so of work just team. how hard they worked and, and – um, the way they wrestled, right, and the way that they put it on the line every single time, and they weren't nervous. They they just went out there and let it fly. Um, so, you know, that's not something I'm going to be worried about. Um, we we bring the talent in, right? The hard work's going to happen. Really good things are, are are coming our way. So, you know, it, it's motivation. You know, you walk past the the national championship banner out there from basketball every day. You see it. Our guys see it, right? You know, we're going to have a banner up for our conference, you know. Um, yeah, it's it's exciting. Yeah, it it is. is exciting. There's lots of things that can happen in a year, right, good and bad. So that's a that's something you always have to keep in the back of your head. But, yeah, is it a possibility that next year, you know, we're the 2025 NCAA National Champs of Division Two, 100%, right? There, there really is. Um, I've not been able to say that as a coach in my career here yet and mean it, right, because it's – not been the truth next year it's a possibility right and so we got a lot of work to do um but they'll do it right they'll i know that and uh yeah hopefully next year we're we're uh we're really excited about you know individual national champs and a, a team national championship and bringing the second one you know in history of the team back here to glenville that'd be awesome well coach uh, like i got told all the other coaches it was it was amazing covering you guys all year uh it was just fun to watch all, all season long but uh we appreciate you coming on today, and congrats on the, the huge season you had this year. Yeah, thank you guys so much. These have been great. I love doing them and, uh, you know, uh, excited to come back next year, and hopefully it's even crazier, right? We got <laughs> a lot more cool stuff to talk about and, and new individuals, new faces, right, also, too, to get, you know, 
hyped about for the season and in the community. So yeah, thank you guys uh, for this. It's been awesome. Thanks, Coach. Welcome back to this week's edition of the Pioneer Coaches Show with one of head softball coach Sarah Schoon. Coach, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, so this past weekend, you started off with State in a doubleheader, lost the first one 3-1, to one, came back and won the second one 11-3. Um, first on that uh, that first game, you got seven hits, but it could only get one run across. Just your thoughts on that first game. You know, um, putting the ball in play was one thing, but having the timely hits, moving runners, um, when a runner gets in a scoring position, you know, if you're up to bat, stepping up, getting that runner across, uh, they did a much better job in the second game doing that. Um, so just moving forward, making sure that we – move the runners when they're in scoring position. Yeah, because you, you mentioned that second game. You scored 11 runs on 12 hits. You played it eight in the fifth. I mean, it was a 3-3 game going into that inning, and then you run rule them. Your thoughts on that one, especially considering the first game we weren't able to do that second game, it completely mm -hmm. changes. Yeah, the girls just made an adjustment at the plate. They got a little more aggressive. Um, you know, we do not want to be patient in the box. We, you, we never want to be patient in the box. We want to go at it as hard as we can, and I think – Getting into um, that fifth inning there, that's when it really came alive and they were aggressive and trusting their bat. Then you moved to Sunday against the uh, 16th best team in the country. They came in 14-1. and one. Uh, It was one nothing game going to the sixth. Kind of like how you guys did against State. Their bats just exploded in the, in, in the sixth inning. And it wasn't really you know, home runs, doubles. It was just they, they started ripping the ball. Your, your thoughts on that first game? Um, I thought we came out for a good five innings there. Uh, wheels kind of fell off there in the sixth. Um, you know, it, it's you're playing a good team and you can't make the little mistakes and you can't um, let little things, as in not moving runners, not putting the ball in play, striking out, uh, looking, little things like that. You do that against a good team, you know, it's going to come back to get you. Yeah, they'll take full advantage of that. And yeah. You look at the last game of the weekend, it was a 3-2 loss in, in 10 innings. Um, it's a tough loss. It was a 2 nothing game. You get you get production all around from freshmen. Uh, Delaney Warnick, mm -hmm. Hannah Howe, Megan Stump goes 10 innings. Your thoughts on their performances? Oh, my gosh. I'm just <laughs> – <laughs> I am so, so proud of them. Um, I, you know, going into um, – situations like that and just being fearless and taking swings at good balls and talk about you know a mentally strong performance Megan Stump is just such a warrior um if you were watching that game you saw her take a comebacker to the leg in the second inning and got her pretty good and she looked up and she said give me that ball we're going so oh my, she, <laughs> she really I mean to go out there and be a good pitcher is one thing. To go out there and be a mentally strong pitcher and finish, oh, that's – I'm just – I'm so proud of her Especially there. against the 16th-ranked team in the country. I mean, yeah. she, the, everybody has to know, obviously, how good Charleston is. And to perform like that was just – it was stellar right. for her. Right. Um, looking at this week, six games, it's a little different than the usual schedule. You start out at Concord um, tomorrow, and then you got Wesleyan and D&E this weekend, teams that were picked in front of you. So a, a little bit of a challenging week. Just your thoughts on how you, you think your girls will perform this week. You know, if we go in and we're aggressive and we attack the ball and we move runners, you know, our pitching has been stellar. Um, our defense is consistent. We just got to go in and we have to attack the ball. Um, you know, taking our hacks and not necessarily waiting for a perfect pitch because you can make a perfect hit out of a non-perfect pitch. So if you just go in there and you're aggressive, good things should happen. So hopefully we control the ball game and do all the little things right. Well, Coach, uh, we appreciate you coming on today. Thank you so much.